Hey, Tim. Hey, Tracy. Um, I have to leave and come back in because I'm logged in the wrong account. I'll be right back. Sounds good. Let me make sure. Well, let me make sure Tim's the host before I do that. All right. Apologies for being in the wrong Zoom room with the wrong Zoom address. Uh, let me get YouTube turned on and then we will uh, get going. Sounds good. We are still waiting on Stefan, who should be our presenter today as well. So we'll not a problem. Give a couple minutes to trickle in here and no worries. Just because, and we'll give Stefan and a few other. Uh, folks a chance to join us i am in another zoom room just in case um somebody uses the old link so we've got that going awesome thank you for doing that no worries no worries and tim just so you know once we kick it off um i'll trim out the first four three or four minutes of the recording so we don't have dead air and uh no one has to listen to my voice talking about turning on YouTube and stuff. So <laughs> sounds we'll good. That. Appreciate that. It is being streamed to the Hyperledger YouTube account. Um, it'll be available. It's available right now, but it's also um, will be available under the identity SIG playlist that we have. All right. All right. Perfect. Tim, Tim, you got it. I'm just going to mute and uh, keep an eye on the other room. Sounds good. Um, well, yeah, it is at 8.05, so we'll go ahead and get started here today. Uh, welcome, everyone. This is the Identity Special Interest Group at Hyperledger. Uh, and uh, today we have a pretty exciting uh, presentation from Stefan Froyu. Uh, Stefan, did I pronounce your name correctly there? Um, not quite. Well, that's my first name, Stefan, and my last name is Mui, M O U Y. But don't worry. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Well, yeah, he's here to share with us a little bit about uh, EIDAS2 and the European Wallet Initiative. And uh, yeah. yeah, and before that, we have a quick summary of some other working group statuses. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so we can do a quick rundown of what everyone's been up to. And I just confirm that you guys can see my screen. Looking good, Tim. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, so to start us off, we have just a few announcements. Uh, we have some upcoming speakers uh, on July 27th and August 10th. So come back if these presentations look uh, interesting to you. Uh, there's also a call for papers open for uh, yeah, the Springer Open, uh, looks like. 
And then we have uh, a meeting on running Hyperledger areas in the browser with non-creds on July 18th. So uh, I believe you can just sign up and join right here through this link. Uh, getting into some working group updates, we have the Hyperledger Indie Contributors Working Group met on the 4th. Uh, was anyone able to attend this meeting that would like to give us a quick summary? All right. Uh, looks like they just held their Indie Summit and they were doing a quick recap on how all that went. Um, the Aries Working Group met on the 12th. Uh, was anyone able to attend the, uh, this session? All right. Uh, yeah, it looks like they were looking at some did peer and community coordinated uh, updates there. And if you'd like more information, uh, all of these links will take you to their most recent uh, activity. The Aries Bifold group uh, met on the 4th. Was anyone able to attend this session? All right. Well, uh, yeah, that looks like they were just doing some bifold updates. Uh, Aries Cloud Agent Python uh, met on the 11th. Are there any updates from anyone who attended this meeting? Okay, looks like they're working on some did peer stuff. And we'll move on from there. Aries Framework JavaScript met on the 6th. Uh, was anyone able to attend this session? Uh, Tim, this is Sean. I was not able to attend the session, but on Tuesday, we had a pretty great um, workshop with Ariel, uh, Karim, and Berend from the Aries Framework JavaScript team showing off 0 0.4.0, the new release, uh, as well as how to use credentials with Aries Framework JavaScript, how it fits into the overall ecosystem. Uh, that is also on YouTube. If anyone would like to watch it, they did a, a really great job of um, sharing some of the hard work that's got into that community recently. And I was unable to mute fast enough, but Occupy was recently mentioned. Uh, there's an organization called Lisi, which has announced uh, the release of its wallet uh, that uses Occupy, it uses non-creds, and I believe they're using um, Indie through ID Union. And so that that came out recently, and we're reaching out to them to do a, a blog post to share some of their experience. So, sorry. All right. No, very cool. Thank you for sharing. Um, so... Awesome. I think that covers Aries stuff. No, that's not recent. Covered that in our last meeting. I do realize it's uh, summer and not everyone is, is meeting super regularly as they used to. I think we've covered those. All right. I think. That, at least according to my list, concludes any updates, unless anyone else has anything they'd like to share. All right, so um, I'm going to go ahead and hand the floor off to uh, Stefan. Is, is that closer? I'm sorry. I'm... Yeah, 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 that's fine. Thank you. All okay, right. um, I'll share my screen. Uh, which one is this? I think this is it. Okay, now can you see my screen as well? Looks good. You're looking good. Okay. Um, well, good morning first. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not sure I know anyone here. Uh, in fact, uh, I've been interacting with um, Bipin for a few years. In fact, we used to be colleagues um, a long time ago. Um, Anyway, and uh, Vipin has, uh, you know, uh, invited me to talk to about the regulatory initiatives in Europe, um, especially the one concerning digital identity. Although I have to say, I've always been quite explicit to Vipin and in, 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 in that um, I know he's very focused on DLT and blockchain. And, uh, <clears throat> and I say to him repeatedly, uh, well, um, it's very interesting, but uh, you're going to be disappointed because in Europe, uh, when it comes to digital identity, there is hardly any mention of uh, of DLT or blockchain. So, 
And we said, well, never mind. Um, you know, it's still interesting to know what's what's happening. So, okay. Um, anyway, so um, as as you can see from the uh, well, from the cover page of cover slide, um, I'm I'm going to talk a little bit about digital identities in the European regulatory environment, and it's um, it's uh, certainly uh, major work and undergoing um, with the revision of the so-called EIDAS. Uh, regulation. Um, so we are up to today, we're still living with the uh, EIDAS 1 regulation, the one that it was um, enacted in, in 2014. And uh, there's uh, a lot of work going on uh, trying to define a new architecture for digital identity schemes, uh, which is called EIDAS 2. And at the core of that project is the digital identity wallet. So let's see a little bit what's um, What's happening here? Um, so yes, uh, as often in Europe, um, it's uh, you know as soon as that's something happening, there is a new regulatory initiative. So you can't really um, you can't really say that uh, you know the European Commission is not active in that field. It is. Everybody's talking about digital identity, and there's uh, uh, there's uh, a lot of uh, movement and. Uh, and uh, a lot of um, <clears throat> change uh, being uh, being implemented. So um, the main effort is the revised uh, EIDAS uh, regulation. Uh, as as mentioned earlier, we're we're still um, you know living with EIDAS one voted in 2014, uh, came into effect in 2016, and 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 even in 2018 for digital identity schemes it's a fairly imperfect uh construction uh it's based on two pillars uh, one is the mutual recognition of digital identity scheme and one is the uh, regulation for so-called trust services i'll come to that later but trust services are primarily electronic signature and the like um it's been very positive on the electronic trust services side, but very disappointing on the digital identity side. And uh, because of that um, disappointment, uh, there has been uh, a new proposal that has been announced uh, nearly two years ago, in fact, over two years ago, which is uh, expected to reach the its legislative uh, process uh, in the coming weeks. Um, this is called EIDAS2. Um, it's not the only piece of regulation that is making reference to digital identities. I don't know if you've seen there's uh, there's been uh, literally last um, in the last few days there's been a digital year draft proposal, which was uh, which was presented um, again. Um, much to Vipin's uh, regret, uh, very little mention of DLT, but I think there is a good reason for that. It's uh, primarily related to the fact that um, offline connectivity is a requirement and uh, um, reconciling offline connectivity with DLT is, uh, is a little bit of a challenge, maybe have different view on that. Um, and also there's uh, you know, a complete revamp of the uh, European anti-money laundering architecture with uh, uniform know your client rules. And uh, these are centered around digital identities for uh, remote ID proofing. So it, it, it all fits together in a way, um, but there's no, um, again, there's no direct reference to DLT in EIDAS2, uh, nor in EIDAS1, of course. Um, there is no, um, explicit reason for that. It's not mentioned in the, um, you know, in the explanatory moment, memorandum prepared for the regulation. But I would say that it's not completely surprising in a European context because um, uh, I think you have to understand that in Europe, uh, digital identity is viewed as the, um, you know, the domaine réservé, the preserve of, of member states and uh, governments are, have, in Europe at least, I'm not taking that positive a view about uh, DLT. Um, however, um, there has, there was initially a reference on the um, electronic trust services side to electronic ledger services, which was, um, sort of indirect way to 
recognize DLT services. Um, that was presented by the European uh, Commission in the initial draft of the EIDAS2 regulation. Um, but it's been removed by, it was maintained by the European Council document, but it has been removed by the European Parliament. Now, um, that may seem like a uh, convoluted um, discussion. What you have to understand is, um, and I think, um, is that currently um, the EIDAS draft is 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 nearing its final well the the eidas2 legislative process is nearing its conclusion there's been a vote been presented by the european commission been voted by the european council which is the body representing the european governments and it's also been voted by the european parliament but not exactly in the same terms so there is now a sort of reconciling effort to come up with a definitive final version um that will uh, uh, apparently a deal has been done uh, literally last week. Uh, we'll see what happens. Um, on the, so EIDAS-1, um, as you can see, it's a fairly modest construction and it's really two houses and their same roof. Um, so you have the electronic trust services side, uh, which is basically private sector, uh, common standard and certification processes. So you're talking about the electronic trust services, uh, e-signatures, electronic seals, electronic stamps, uh, registered messages, uh, electronic web authentications, common rules, technical specification, usually they're prepared by the uh, European um, um, uh, ETSI, which is the European uh, Standards Specification Agency. Um, they are offered by the private sector, uh, so every company who wants to become a trust service provider can apply. It just has to uh, be certified uh, with a common framework. And once it is certified, it can offer trust services uh, throughout the uh, European Union uh, without discrimination. They have to be accepted on, on the same basis. On the EID side, you're really talking about a completely different construction. You're really talking about um, an intergovernmental recognition of, of, uh, of digital identity schemes that have been notified by member states to the European Commission. Um, so it's a voluntary framework. It has a very public sector focus. Um, that's one of the reasons why it hasn't been successful, actually. Uh, for example, the when it was presented, the 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 the, 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 the use, one of the use cases that was uh, promoted was uh, a Finnish student enrolling in a Spanish university, and instead of doing all the paperwork uh, by paper and by mail, he would do that electronically. Um, that's fine, but you know how often do you have to do this? I mean, in your life, I mean, maybe twice, uh, once, twice, but not more than that usually. So it's not really worth. Uh, Anyway, it's not, not like paying electronically or anything that comes as a daily occurrence. Um, another problem was that there are very few on the EID side, there are very few common technical specifications. So member states have considerable freedom to implement digital identity schemes, which led to interoperability issues. Um, so they're not exactly the same. They can't correspond. You know, they do not fit quite well one with another. Um, it's not that easy to make them work together. So interoperability is an issue. And on top of that, it's based on, a, on an IT protocol that is uh, that is now looks uh, quite dated. So, um, and does not integrate mobile device usage. Um, so um, quite successful on the e-trust services side, um, very disappointing on the EID side. Uh, but in spite of that, it, it still remains a landmark regulation for digital identity. I think the main reason is that uh, it's the first, and if I'm not mistaken, it's still the only set of rule organizing the cross-border recognition of digital identities. I don't think anywhere in the world you have anywhere um, uh, a framework a framework that says, you know, digital identity not, uh, coming from that country is are going to be recognized with the same value, with the same effect in, in other countries. And uh, 
and it also enshrines the uh, LOA, the level of assurance concept for digital identity. It's not, it's, of course, it's not a unique uh, European concept, but it's, um, it's uh, you know, it, it was quite uh, 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 significant and uh, certainly is, is quite uh, structural as, a, as, as an element. Um, I had a slide for um, the pin, but unfortunately it's not here because, um, as mentioned earlier, I made a couple of presentations last year, one last year and one two years ago on the very same topic. So um, I was wondering if uh, Vipin was going to think that, um, you know, it was a repeat of, of what I had said at the time. And um, basically, I, I suspect none of you have uh, were present at the, you know, when, when we made a presentation in 2021, 2022. But anyway, what's the latest news? Um, so the latest news, oops, sorry. Um, well, first of all, before we get into this, um, maybe we should uh, have a word of caution for non-Europeans. I guess that's the vast majority of the audience today. Um, one is uh, EIDAS2 is uh, a very ambitious project. There is no question that, um, this is certainly a piece of regulation where you cannot say that um, um, the European Commission has lacked ambition. Um, so it's aiming for the highest level of assurance, the highest level of privacy, the greatest diversity of use cases. So reconciling these uh, requirements is uh, guaranteed to be challenging um, and, and, and difficult. Um, we can see that already. Um, and, and one of the problems that is uh, facing the, uh, uh, the, the team leading the efforts uh, of, um, is that um, you know, technical specifications are not that easy to find in order to cover so, such a broad spectrum of use cases. Some are only in draft form, some are not fully stable. So it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a difficult decision. Um, the second the second aspect you have to bear in mind, which is that um, it's a regulatory initiative and it's, um, it has very obvious, very clear, very powerful, in fact, political backing. Um, it's, it's seen rightly or wrongly as the most tangible uh, initiative for European citizens in the digital area. Um, and it's uh, you know it's heavily supported by the I would say the heads of the, the uh, of the um, of the uh, European Commission, but also the uh, uh, European Council representing governments. Um, and it's 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 a public. Um, you have to understand that it is a public initiative in many ways. The member states uh, will notify the digital identity whether they have discretion in in. Um, in defining who will, uh, you know, who will be allowed to present uh, a digital identity wallet, and they are legally responsible for that process. So uh, they uh, call the shop still. Um, it's it's taking a lot of time. It's already been two years in the making, um, and I think you really are. Uh, we're still, I think, uh, not even sure with midway. Um, I would consider a five-year horizon. So basically you would still have three years to go. It's not completely, um, it's not completely uh, surprising given that, uh, you know, this is an effort that is effectively involving three, 30 different countries. And um, that means that, uh, you know, success is uh, by no means guaranteed, but uh, likewise, uh, on the other hand, you know, complete failure is very unlikely. So, you know, we're probably, if it's somewhere in the middle, uh, you know, which side, uh, where are we going to end up? Uh, that's still um, very undecided. There are many factors that have to be worked out. Um, it's, it's pretty, pretty uh, still, uh, the jury's still out. There are a lot of uh, things that need to be uh, decided still. Um, on the EIDAS ecosystem, um, well, hold on. Maybe I should have been go here. Uh, so where are we now? Um, Basically, the, the first project was presented in um, 2021. Um, that's when I made the first presentation to the Pinsburg. Um, then there was an AIDAS expert group set up in October of that year. 
there was a first version of the architecture and reference uh, framework document presented in 2022. Uh, and then, you know, the legislative process was, uh, was uh, initiated, uh, first considered by the parliament in uh, October 21. Uh, four large scale pilots launched uh, in December of last year, wallet design consortium selected. Uh, draft regulation approved by the European Council in December of last year, approved by the European Parliament in March. And now there is a so-called trilogue process aiming to reconcile the um, EU Council and the EU Parliament's position uh, initiated uh, in April. Uh, why is it called a trilogue and not a dialogue? Because the European Commission is involved as well. Um, so, however, um, you may have seen last, uh, well, in fact, 10 days ago, there was uh, a political agreement um, and a statement saying that, in fact, uh, you know, the uh, representatives of the European Council and of the European Parliament had uh, agreed, uh, settled, uh, found a deal, so to speak, on the, on the key terms of the European Digital Identity Framework. Um, I've, you know, put extracts of the, uh, of the uh, EU Commission communique. Um, we'll see, we haven't seen the final draft, but it's, it's very likely to be somewhere between what uh, has been approved by the European Council and what's been approved by the European Parliament. Um, there is, uh, for, for you guys who are interested in DLT, there is an interesting topic here because the um, electronic ledger services were struck down by the European Parliament on the basis that, uh, you know, they are um, not consistent with an environmentally friendly environment. Um, so they were, you know, for that, uh, you know, the, 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 um, the green movement in, in Europe is quite strong. So they, they've taken a, a negative view of DLT services and they, they shut down everything that was uh, even remotely related to DLT in the draft. Um, whether that will continue, will, will that position will be upheld in the final draft, we don't know. I mean, that's uh, one of the things to see. Um, anyway, and once that is done, you know, once you have a regulation, um, it's not, you know, it's not the end of the process by any means. One of the reasons is that because there are um, uh, uh, quite a few delegated and implementation acts to prepare. So they are, you know, second, secondary regulation, if you wish, um, that is being um, mentioned in the, uh, in the EIDAS regulation, but not yet drafted. So that's, uh, you know, that's another regulatory dimension to consider. Um, and on top of that, there are two other aspects. One is the so-called uh, architecture and reference document. This is a document that is uh, defining the technical specifications of the digital identity wallets. Um, if you're interested in that, uh, there is already, um, well, it's, it's an ongoing document. So, you know, you have, um, it's, there's an iterative process uh, there is uh, the first version was published uh, in February last year. The current version is uh, the current public version is uh, was probably released in April, um, and uh, I think the the next one should be available within weeks or maybe days actually. And um, I'll, I'll mention a little bit about this. And on top of that, there is uh, a so-called reference reference implementation of the digital identity wallet. So there is. Uh, a uh, consortium that has been assigned or um, with the task of, of building uh, a digital identity wallet that will have to be after that, that will be used by, um, uh, uh, by uh, member states when notifying their own uh, solution. And on top of that, you have uh, currently four so-called large scale pilots that are are designed to test the real life uh, usage of the digital identity wallets. Um, there are two uh, use cases that have been prioritized to that effect. One is the uh, um, mobile driving license. Um, and the second one is the identification and uh, authentication on, for online services. But on top of that, there are 
other use cases like uh, health, educational credentials, disability diplomas, uh, digital finance, dig uh, digital travel credentials. So if you look at some of these uh, large scale pilots are public, uh, three of the four, I think the fourth is still to be announced, but three of them are known. They have a website, they have uh, already uh, published information about which use case they're considering. Um, there isn't that much information yet, but you know it's uh, and they are uh, um, these are consortium that are um, gathering uh, firms from companies from different environments. I, I've, I've been looking for um, obvious reasons. I've been looking at the uh, financial sector, digital finance use case, and you can see that uh, you know quite a few banks are involved in the. There's one large scale pilot that is uh, fully dedicated to payments, um, and there's another one that is. Uh, 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 dedicated to digital travel credentials, including payments. Um, and they include most of the big names in Europe on that. So um, you'll, um, we'll see. Um, so where are we now? Um, yeah, that we've done, that we've done, that I think we've done. Okay, um, now just how familiar are, the, are you guys uh, with, the, are with the digital identity wallet? Do you, I mean, do we need to go through the uh, detailed presentation or is this something that is quite well known? I would I think this group, go ahead, Tim, sorry. Oh, so I was gonna say, I think this group would be at least uh, fairly familiar with the with the wallet. Okay, uh, uh, right, just, so just a quick recap. Uh, well, it's first of all, you know, they must be accredited. They must comply with the common specifications issued, you know, that will be, uh, that will appear in the uh, architecture reference document. They have to be issued or approved by member states. So there's, uh, you know, there's, if, if a member state does not like your solution, even though it may be a very good solution, no, you know, there's no hope, I'm afraid. Um, they must offer a high level of assurance. Uh, they must put the users in full control of the wallet. They have to be accepted by for identity proofing by relying parties offering financial and other key services, as well as uh, very large online platforms. Um, so that's an important aspect because it means that uh, you know all providers of uh, key services will have to accept digital identity wallet, no matter what. Uh, they have to accept um, electronically tested attestations. It will have to be free of charge for users. They must be able to create, uh, to allow the, the user to sign uh, with the highest level of, uh, of certainty. So this is a qualified electronic signature. They uh, must allow the user to interact online and offline, and they must support uh, strong customer authentication requirements, uh, including for payment. That is, incidentally, that is a topic that is uh, creating a lot of tension with the banking sector, that is uh, uh, the banking industry that is not really happy, and that's an understatement about this. Um, and um, on top of that, you know, they should be able to strengthen privacy. They should be able to learn several identity profiles and should be able to support CBDC interactions. So we'll see how far we go in that. Um, Stephanie, can I ask you a question about the last slide? Yeah. In the early days of self-sovereign identity, correlation resistance was a very big deal. It's, it's, it's absolutely something that a lot of organizations looked at as a requirement. Um, unique identifiers kind of defeat. <laughs> Correlation resistance. When you say whenever required, who is who is the doing the requiring? Is it a, is it a bank? Is it a state? Is it any entity on a network could require your unique identifier? Okay, that I know what you're talking. Yeah, I know what you're referring to. There's a reference to the unique identifier in the regulation. Um, that is, um, I think. What, what it what it came from uh, surprisingly is from the it's 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 a request or a demand depending on how you say it from the tax authorities oh, because okay. um these are 
you know, they are saying, well, some people come up when, with one country with uh, one identity and they're binational, they have another identity from another country and we cannot correlate the two. And this is problematic. Don't ask me why, but this is apparently quite problematic for tax avoidance because it facilitates tax avoidance. That is um, a great answer. Thank you. I, I, I so, wasn't expecting so, that. Great. Yeah, yeah. So just to, so, as a, you know that you, you need to know that, but once you know that, you can understand why it's in there. Now people are saying, and I think a lot of people, including I think you and me, are saying, "Hey, you know, but a unique identifier is the worst thing that can you can think about from a privacy viewpoint because basically it allows uh, anyone to track your interactions um, and and monitor your usage." So of course that's highly highly problematic. Um, so there's there's a tension between these two, um, I would say, um, uh, competing um, the demands, if you wish, or objectives. Um, how that is going to be, that's one of the topics that is still uh, not completely decided. We'll see in the final version how it will be taken care of. I think it's likely to remain as a requirement, but not everybody, I think what was likely to happen is that only certain public sector reliant parties will be able to, will be allowed to require the unique identifier. That's what I understand. Understood. Th thank you so much for that answer. Okay. Um, right. Um, so at the very at the very core, you know, the, the, the ecosystem is pretty simple. You have uh, basically an app provider that publishes the digital uh, the um, digital identity wallet on the app. It's been, of course, it has to be certified. It has to be not only has it got to be certified, but it has to be uh, approved by a member state, and it has to be notified to the European Commission. So it has to be, uh, I would say, approved by a state. And once that is done, the uh, wallet user can use the app, can download an identity profile. That identity profile is effectively provided by so-called PID providers, uh, providers of person identification data. Um, and on top of that, you can also have um, um, electronically attested attributes, which are issued by uh, effectively trust service providers. And, um, and uh, you can combine the two, of course, and uh, those are used to and communicated to relying parties in the normal course of action. So what that means uh, is that you have, uh, you know, a plethora of uh, possible use cases that are, can be considered um, public sector, private sector, uh, banking, non-banking, health, um, travel, there's virtually no um element no no aspect of uh, of of one's life that cannot be uh considered or cannot be uh, uh used by the digital identity wallet we'll see again we'll see how this is going to work in practice but uh you know the ambition is certainly uh uh is, is certainly there um Bear in mind that um, you know you have public attributes, private attributes, and you have the ability to sign um, with the highest level of uh, of legal certainty, which is the qualified electronic signature. The combined effect of those should be quite uh, transformational, assuming it works well. Um, I've provided the. Um, what I what I find is that uh, you know authorizing. I've been focusing a lot on the payment use case, and I I uh, do believe that the ability to um, interact offline is 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 absolutely key. So uh, there's been um, a fair amount of focus on that, and um, and this is also quite relevant for the, the digital identity wallet to be used uh, with uh, in connection with. Uh, some bank digital currencies and the digital year in particular. Uh, again, if you're interested at the uh, use cases, you should look at the uh, um, website of the EWD consortium, the potential consortium or the Nobit consortium. These are the three publicly known uh, consortia dealing with the uh, preparing, uh, working on use cases. Now, on the technology side, um, the 
current version of the AI um, does um, mention some um, technology choices that have been made. And what you can see is that uh, those choices reflect the so-called priority use cases. Um, if you remember, one of the priority use cases is the uh, mobile uh, driving license. I, I gather in the US, you, you do have, um, Apple has been quite instrumental in uh, deploying uh, um, mobile driving license on the iPhone. And uh, I think basically what is what is considered is, is, is a repeat of that process. And uh, so the uh, there is a dedicated uh, ISO standard for that, uh, which is the ISO 18013 slash five. Um, and um, and uh, that is, uh, you know, that is likely to be used for proximity connections, uh, proximity connections being when the uh, wallet user is, uh, let's say, physically present uh, with the relying party and is, in fact, interacting typically with uh, an NFC um, protocol or, uh, or a Bluetooth or, or QR code. Um, However, the, um, <clears throat> I'm not totally convinced that it can be uh, developed beyond the uh, mobile driving license use case because I don't know if you're familiar with this, but it's, um, it's basically transferring to the relying party the, uh, the uh, digital uh, photo of the wallet user. Um, which is fine if you're presenting it to, to a police officer, but not so fine if you're presenting it to someone you really don't know and you can't trust. Um, so um, um, there is also reference to the uh, W3C verifiable credential data model, um, but it appears to be given second priority compared to the uh, uh, MDOC uh, ISO 18 of 135 um, specifications. So, um, again, no mention of DLT. Um, you know, I'm part of the, I'm not um, a technology expert, so I think, uh, um, but I have, I'm attending the uh, uh, EIDS expert group meetings. I have never heard anyone saying, look, uh, we should mention DLT. So why that is, I, I don't know. I mean, I, um, but it's, it's a fact of life. The other thing that is quite, uh, quite clear is that uh, those specifications are, not addressing the relying party authentication. Um, it's, it's basically um, not addressing the fact that, uh, you know, maybe in digital interaction, you should start from a, a zero trust uh, basis or principle. You should apply zero trust principle. And, uh, you know, you should make sure that uh, the relying party is fully authenticated before you can do anything with it. Okay, on the other hand, it's still early days on the technology side, because the ARF is designed to be a work in progress document. And, um, and it's, it's not, uh, you know, it's quite possible that uh, changes would be made to the choice of specification, hopefully not major, major change, because you cannot completely, you know, um, you know, restart from scratch and, and, and forget everything you've been working on for months, but uh, there is certainly room for adjustment. Um, so payment, which is my area of specialty. Um, yeah, maybe before that, uh, first, the EIDAS2 paradigm is, uh, is really moving from a user control uh, to a user control identity-based system. Um, maybe SSI, I don't know if SSI is really the right word. Um, possibly, maybe yes, maybe not. Um, but um, what's also clear is that um, Payments are key, uh, key parts of most uh, wallet ecosystems in interaction and digital interactions. Um, and uh, there is uh, there is a renewed impetus for the uh, given all the work on the digital year. I did mention the fact that um, back here, where is this? Oh no, um, sorry. Oh, it's here. Okay, yeah. Um, I'll come to that in a minute. Um, 
But, uh, and, and uh, you know, at a, at a wider level, there is a clear recognition that uh, digital interaction that can combine, uh, I would say, core ID attributes, status and professional attributes like uh, diplomas, licenses, or eligibility um, uh, credentials can open, you know, a new, and payment attributes can open a new way to be quite transformational for customer interaction and customer experience. So we'll see how far as it goes. Um, the, uh, on the payment use case, I was saying that uh, the um, uh, very recent digital year draft proposal makes uh, quite a few references to digital identity wallet for CBDC interactions. You know, I've, said, I've copied the, uh, a few of the uh, mentions of the uh, digital identity wallet in the recital and substantive provisions. Um, again, you know, it's, it, it clearly is recognized for, you know, the, the digital identity wallet will clearly be recognized for uh, interactions on digital years. We'll see again, it's still early days, but, you know, we'll see how things will turn out. But um, um, the, uh, I would say certainly the uh, um, digital identity wallet is, is on the radar screen of the uh, European Cell Bank uh, when it comes to the digital year. Um, when you're looking at a payment case, uh, of course, uh, you know, the ability to store and communicate personal identifiable information and, uh, and electronically attested attributes to rely on quality is very important. Uh, you have to be able to use uh, to comply with strong customer authentication requirement. As you probably know, I don't quite know what the situation in the is in the U.S., but in Europe, uh, this is a this is an absolute uh, payment requirement. So, um, and uh, you know, and the fact that uh, the uh, wallet will have to be accepted by all payment service providers, including. Or banks, as a matter of fact, is is, is important. Um, anyway, so that's where we are now. Um, now the question is uh, whether this is fit for payment purposes so far. Um, again, at the art of payment interactions, um, you have zero trust by default, so mutual authentication is required for for simply for for prevention purposes. Um, it's currently not. Uh, define in the RF. I think it will be, but you know, it, it's, it's probably going to rely on, 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 I would say, X509 certificates, but we'll see how that will work out. Then you need to ensure legal irrevocability of payment instructions. Um, and you need to ensure that, you know, if you have a payer with a wallet and a payee with a wallet, uh, you need to make sure that they're both fully committed legally. And uh, that also implies having a, a an audit trail of the payment messages that can be archived and that can be presented in court proceedings. And uh, as mentioned, you need to have strong user authentication in line with the uh, European uh, regulation on payments. But it's, it's currently not obvious at all that uh, these requirements will, can be met with the current set of contemplated specifications. Um, I, this is my private view, of course, but uh, I do think that uh, you know the ISO eighteen oh one three five specification is uh, standard is uh, privacy uh, invasive. Um, I hope you do not disagree with me, but I think the W three C verifiable credentials uh, specifications are not designed to deal with mutual commitments. Uh, they do not uh, also readily support offline interactions. And the REST API request responses are not uh, tailored to meet audit trail requirements. So these are, you know, um, technical issues. Um, it's uh, it's work in progress. It's uh, it's annoying if it's, um, you know, there is a lot, a lot of work to be done. Um, we'll see if the ambition, the considerable ambition of the digital identity wallet will translate into meaningful reality. There's, uh, you know, there's a little bit of doubt about that, um, but we'll see. I mean, it's, uh, anyway, well, it's not the end of the story. We're not even midway through the, uh, the process. So we'll see what happens. Um, 
Any, before I move uh, to the next, uh, in fact, time is running out. I can see maybe I should stop here. Is there any, any comments, any, any suggestion, any questions, or is that all clear? I would say no questions currently. So if you have like a, a quick summary or anything, I think that would be. Yeah, cool. I think, I mean, I think it's it, it's really here. I think that's probably the best. Uh, give you that slide to give you the best view of, uh, you know, the the AI Desk 2 initiative. Um, uh, again, a lot of the basically, mm -hmm. The next steps uh, within a few weeks, I think we are going to see the final, final version of the EIDAS regulation, the one that will reach the salary books. Um, we will also see an updated version of the architecture and reference document, and that will probably include uh, provision on, on mutual authentication and give more clarity on the choice of technologies that are going to be used. Um, um, there is going to be work done. There is work done on the, uh, I would say, prototype implementation of the wallet. Um, and the LSPs will start to get into real motion currently. You know, the, on the LSP side, the consortia has been, have been formed. They made an offer. They've been accepted. They have negotiated a, um, a contract with the European Commission, but they haven't really um, started work they need to have the uh, a workable um uh, prototype wanted to do that so they're waiting for the referent uh, for the reference implementation side and then more clarity on the air side as well i think that's what we can say um it's an exciting project uh, um it's certainly uh very ambitious no doubt um and uh and we'll see what happens uh, maybe i have to I'll be given an, another opportunity to uh, present it uh, in, in, in 12 months time. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I think uh, it's exactly what you said. It's ambitious, but it is exciting. And uh, yeah, if there's more updates in another year, we'd love to have you back. Mm -hmm. uh, well, yeah, I think uh, we'll throw it out to questions one more time, but uh, I think if there are still none, uh, we appreciate you coming to talk to us today. Well, thank you. That's, um, um, can I ask you a question, though? I, I gather the um, hyperledger. Can you clarify what's the difference between the hy hyperledger identity special interest group and the previous group uh, um, um, managed by by VP? Is it is it more or less the same, or is it a different one? Um, I am unfamiliar, unfortunately, with the previous group managed by VIPIN. So I know that we were combined uh, at some point, but I, I was not part of that conversation, unfortunately. All right. Okay. So sorry about that. No uh, problem. All right. Okay. Well, well listen, um, all right. If you're, if you're interested in the presentation, I'm happy to, um, give you the uh, link to the uh, to the document so you can take a, a closer look at it um, later. No, that would be awesome. I would appreciate that. Okay, uh, perfect. Very good. Uh, well, yeah, I think that's it. Hi, guys. I don't okay. know if you can hear me. Yeah. 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 Okay, guys. My name is Jairo Romo. Uh, I'm going to go directly to the question. I was uh, I was working in the past, or I've been working during the last couple of years for trade finance, blockchain, trade finance. One of the initiatives, as you know, trade finance is one of the industries that needs more these days digitalization, standardization, those type of things. Identity is incredibly important at an individual level, but it's also important at a company level. Who is buying what? Who is sending what? Who is responsible of what? There was a couple of initiatives of there was an initiative to implement a global legal entity or legal entity identifier uh, promoted or supported by the G7 called GLIF. 
that initiative i was uh, i was uh, uh, doing some type of analysis around it was an initiative for to to create an identifier that every single country from the G7 and now there are more countries were going to implement to introduce at a global level to do exactly that to identify or to have a global identifier mm -hmm. for companies more than for individuals. Do you know anything about this initiative? Do you know well, anything? About I I've heard of them to be honest, but I'm not. Um... I'm not really involved. I think I should have mentioned earlier that the, um, I hope it's clear from my presentation though. Um, I should have mentioned earlier that the digital identity wallet is primarily designed to be used by an individual. So not, okay. no, not a legal entity per se. The, however, um, the uh, individual can produce uh, electronically attested attributes, and these can be, for example, authority to act on behalf of a legal entity. I know that. But effectively, here you're really talking about um, uh, digital identity and, and service primarily to be used by individuals, maybe in a professional capacity, but primarily for individuals. What you're referring to is a, is a purely um, um, uh, an initiative that's been going on for many years, in fact, uh, um, to uh, define a common uh, registration scheme for all legal entities. Um, exactly. I've heard of it. I've, uh, you know, heard of it repeatedly, but I'm not involved in that effort. I'm not really part of it. It's uh, different. Um, uh, so I really cannot talk meaningfully about it, I'm afraid. Okay. Another quick, quick question. Then, if we are, oh, uh, this wallet we are talking about, uh, could be prepared in terms of technology, in terms of infrastructure, to be able to cover in the future as a second phase, or as a next, next stage for these uh, 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 legal or, or enterprises identities or identifiers? Yeah, I mean, there's what what I can say is that um, there's always in the background, you know, the, the the let me put it this way: the the primary effort is clearly individuals. Okay. Okay. Now people are saying, oh yes, but individuals they act, you know, they can act on behalf of a legal entity. That is seen as. Um, you know, as effectively an individual in 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 a, acting in a defined capacity with a defined authorization or authority credential, acting to able being able to you know, for example, to activate uh, a company's accounts, for example, um, it's 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 a set of uh, it's a subset of uh, it's seen as a subset of of uh, use cases that are considered by the EIDS2 initiative. Um, so that will come. Um, what I think you're unlikely to see though is a wallet that is a pure company wallet that has no individual's name to it, so to speak. Okay. Oh, just, to, just to jump in, um, I think what you're Thanks. referring to, uh, Mr. Romo, is uh, the GLEAF, the Global Legal Entity Identity yeah. Foundation. I, I posted yeah. it in the chat, and then the identifier is the legal entity identifier, and then the company credentials will be the virtual legal entity identifier. And I agree with your assessment, uh, uh, <laughs> Mr. Romo, uh, that uh, the EIDIS is more toward individuals and the LEI is yeah yeah I mean it, it's it's officer. very it's very clear that EIDAS is geared towards individuals because in fact you know we're really talking about here um where is this uh, um, yes uh you know you do have PID providers at the core of the EIDAS project you have PID providers who are providing core identity attributes to an individual and then, you know, so that's, you know, that's the key, uh, quite a fundamental structural building block. On top of that, you can have, uh, you know, that individual authorized to act on behalf of a company. There is no question about that. But it, it's, it's um, you know, it's seen uh, as another um, 
layer of, of authority or uh, uh, given to one individual. So it's not purely, you know, a, a tool for legal entities that has no connection with any individual. I mean, that's very clear. Right. Well, assuming that both of them succeed, they'll probably be bridge credentials and, and all that stuff in the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty the LA sure that's the opposite. The LA is in, there's companies and then they have individuals working for them, but the credentials are, are all company focused. Yeah. Yep, yep. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Stefani. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Thank you for your presentation. Thanks, Charles. Okay. Well, nice interacting with you guys. I think it's it's the one hour talk anyway, so we're we're done. <laughs> All right. Good. Have a good day. All right. Bye. Have a good one, everyone. Bye.